So on behalf of the Center for Latin American Studies, uh, I would like to welcome you all to the fifth annual Haiti Week. Uh, this has been a big success in the past. As many of you know, we started offering Haitian Creole language classes on campus uh, some years back. Uh, and we have such a strength in the Caribbean and in Haiti, we decided to start doing this week to pull people together and to give you a sense of what's going on on campus. Uh, so, and what a time to be talking about Haiti, uh, right, with everything that's in the newspapers these days. So on behalf of the center, I would really like, I want to thank you all for coming today. And I'm going to turn the program over to Professor, T Professor Tiffany Patterson, uh, who's going to moderate the session. Tiffany? Thank you. And welcome to everyone who are beautiful faces that are sitting in front of me. Cross my fingers and hope you don't get kicked out. That's what happened in my class on Blacks in Latin America just about 30 minutes ago. Okay. It's my pleasure to introduce our panel today. Uh, Dr. Jesus Ruiz earned his PhD from Lane University, and he's uh, one of our newest members to our little uh, family here at Vanderbilt. He specializes in the history of, of the Haitian Revolution, the Caribbean and Black and Black Atlantic and Afro-Latin America. Former Fulbright scholar, scholar to Spain and research has been funded by Schomburg uh, Center, John, John Carter Brown Library, among others. Uh, currently an ACLS Emerging Voices Fellow at Duke University and lecturer at Vanderbilt Center for Latin American Studies. Um, our second presenter is uh, our longtime friend, or my longtime friend, Jane Landers, uh, historian of the Latin America, and and um, I only wrote Latin America, okay, <laughs> and 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 the larger world uh, in the early modern history. Her books include Black Society in Spanish Florida, Slave Subjects and Subversives, and Atlantic Creoles in the Age of Revolution. She is our go-to a star uh, in this area, uh, without a doubt. And finally, um, my colleague uh, and friend, uh, Brandon R. Bird is a historian of 19th and 20th century black intellectual and social history with a special focus on Pan-Africanism and black internationalism. His book, Black Republic, African-Americans and the Fate of Haiti uh, was published in 2020, uh, University of Pennsylvania Press. Uh, it recovers a crucial an overlooked chapter of black internationalism and political thought by exploring the attitudes that US black, American, black intellectuals in the post US civil rights era held toward Haiti. It received an honorable mention for the Isis Duarte Book Prize from the Latin American Studies Association. Dr. Bird teaches in the Department of History. I'm neglected to add, I'm sorry, I'm going so fast, that Jane is in the Department of History as well at Vanderbilt University, and he is also co-editor of Black Lives and Liberation series published by Vanderbilt University Press. It is indeed uh, my pleasure to welcome everyone. And uh, I'll, I'll, I must add the following, I'm going to miss the Center for Latin American Studies who were uh, in my, on my floor and we were all right there together. So I'm mad at you for leaving. Um, <laughs> we can open it up now for you, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Patterson, uh, for, for that introduction and, and for moderating this discussion today. Um, thank you to, to Ted, uh, Avery, Colleen, Alma, everybody at the center um, for, for organizing this and, every, and, and my fellow panelists as well. Um, Jane, as you know, I look up to you in many ways and, and, and Brandon, I look forward to uh, further uh, discussions and, and, and meeting you finally. So, start the timer. As we speak, Haiti is engulfed in political turmoil and a constitutional crisis in which Haitian citizens are demanding uh, that President Jovenel Moise uh, resign. Student activists, journalists, and so many others currently are suffering the very real consequences of a violent and corrupt state in which security forces have gone so far as to shoot Haitian citizens with live ammunition. During the last two presidencies, the Haitian people have remained unwavering in their fight for democracy. And I can tell you, not only as a historian, but as someone who has heard the accounts of Haitian refugees themselves firsthand, their fight is deeply rooted in a long history of liberation struggle that dates back to the Haitian Revolution. Ju uh, historian Julia Gaffield, in a, in a late 2019 piece, pointed out that 
Haitian pro-democracy movements had summoned the spirits of their forefathers, the leaders of the Haitian revolution, in waging their struggles for sovereignty. She was speaking specifically of Haiti's first head of state, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, um, and one of the current movements in, uh, in Haiti, uh, which is called Petit Dessalines, uh, slash political party. Uh, Dessalines, by October of 1804, had become not a president of a republic, but the emperor and the first of, of the first empire of Haiti. And so it is in this spirit that I wanna make my interventions here today. As a historian of the Haitian revolution, I am well aware of the lessons that Jean Casimir reminds us of in his new book, The Haitians of Decolonial History. In it, Casimir teaches us how the indigenous army that defeated the French and won Haitian independence didn't necessarily refuse the original right of conquest of the colonial power. Instead, he, he, he points out, they appropriated this right. Haiti's new leaders became the owners of the land, a sort of new conqueror, and they had to turn to focus on how to maintain the plantation system of agriculture. But those from below, those that waged the revolution had been captives of this plantation system for so long that they refused any other form of enslavement. And so they developed counter plantation models. And yet in many ways, abolition did not necessarily mean freedom. And this is one of the seemingly paradoxical processes in the Haitian revolution, which as historians of the age of Atlantic revolutions have pointed out, is in, many ways, um, uh, is in many ways the foundation of modernity. In the case of the United States, a new nation founded on liberty and justice for all, as we know, a largely still slaveholding society. In the case of France, with the ideals of the rights of man, of liberté, égalité, and yet a return to slavery and empire with Napoleon. Another such paradox, at least in the minds of many scholars, has been the question of what, have, uh, of what some have called the mystifying royalist posture of Haiti's insurgents, Haiti's original insurgents. Indeed, perhaps it is CLR James's groundbreaking work, which side note was the first book I ever read on the Haitian revolution, The Black Jacobins, that acted as a precedent. Historians since then have emphasized what was seen as revolutionary, as egalitarian, but precisely within the political project of the liberal nation state, of Republican ideology, of enlightenment thought. And so it may be distasteful for some to take a deeper look into the political history of royalism within the Haitian revolution. Indeed, contemporaries of King Henri uh, Christophe's kingdom of Haiti viewed his rule and political system rooted in monarchy as inherently risable. Why risable? Because Henry the First Kingdom went against the revolutionary tide for those on the left and for those on the right because he had no viable genealogical claim to any Haitian throne. Thus, I believe, and my current work shows, that we've misread royalism for various reasons. If, you, if we view this political consciousness from the perspective of the Spanish empire and of Western Central African thought, then the politics of royalism is the logical choice for Haitian revolutionaries in this era of Atlantic revolutions. In other words, African and African descendants fell back into known categories and symbols, but created radical variations of what they thought freedoms and rights meant for them. It wasn't simply a cynical takeover from self-serving leaders, and perhaps we need to think that the rights of man and citizen were not the natural response, and that it was not appealing to throw God out the door. After all, monarchy and empire continued in the Mexico of Agustin I of Iturbide, in the Brazil of Pedro I and Pedro II, not to mention the loyalty to the Spanish crown of African and African descendants in Cuba leading up to their independence. Indeed, as a Brazilian historian recently suggested to me at Duke, popularity among monarchical visions, the strong support for the monarchy and continued loyalty to a monarchist cause have in many ways been the basis of Afro-Brazilian cultural institutions in Brazil up until this day. And so, one of the questions that becomes crucial for me is when Afro-North Americans become Republicans is, is, is something that I want to throw out there. And as somebody, just another side note, who has lived 
nearly the, the last decade in New Orleans, I can tell you that as we speak, well, maybe not this year since most of the things have been canceled, but uh, traditionally kings and queens uh, are being crowned in the various Mardi Gras parades that happen in, in that city. Again, Spanish and French former uh, colonial outpost. Laurent Dubois uh, recently suggested that in, in their authoritarian tendencies, perhaps Republican and monarchical rule in post-independence Haiti were not so different. I go a step further to say that Haiti was fated to choose among kings. So as a, as a way of conclusion, I wanna just lay out uh, some of the stakes that I see here, what, what, what the stakes may be. First, the centrality of black people and their agency in this history is critical. And so when we think about the ongoing struggles in Haiti, we must remember that Haitian people were apt at deploying political symbols and waging a struggle for liberation themselves and without any sort of external or foreign political influence. Secondly, the politics of royalism and therefore a new political history of Haiti carries also, also carries high stakes, namely, I read it as a challenge to the sometimes mythical and often linear and tele teleological histories of liberal revolution, which too commonly point, uh, commonly point toward the inevitability of Republican nation states or liberal democracies. And finally, and perhaps most crucially, in an atmosphere where both here in the United States and globally, nativism and anti-blackness are on the rise, what can a black politics which centers black actors whose politics may not always fall in line with the universalist claims of liberal thought, what can that teach us about how to embark on a, pass on a possible path towards full liberation? Perhaps it is time that we again turn to Haiti for lessons on political participation and a fight for freedom and rights. Haiti's ongoing massive protest movements are rooted in a sense of history one that pushes for liberation at all costs. Thank you. Thank you. Jane? Thank you. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Ted and Avery and Alma and Colleen and everybody for organizing, all my panelists for serving and Tiffany has the hard job of moderating us all. Um, not easy. <laughs> um, okay, so Jesus has set up a, a very interesting and uh, you know sophisticated theoretical framework here. I'm going to go very simply to the people who actually fought the revolution, which is one of my interests in bringing them back to life and using as much as I can of uh, the archives I, I dig through to actually give them voice in this matter. Um, and it all began sort of serendipitously in doing my dissertation on black society in Spanish Florida encountering Jorge, as they called him, Biasu, uh, one of the original leaders of the revolution who had been dispersed to Florida. And I wondered about him. I collected what I could from the Spanish Florida archives. And in later works, then I went on and built up a sort of a prosopography, a group biography of some of the leaders and of the outcomes, which end up becoming, uh, after the success of the, of the revolt, a, a rather uh, sad, I would say, story of another diaspora throughout the Atlantic world, uh, which carries all of these people to dispersed locales and I'm following them there now. Um, so uh, I think everybody who may be panelists, and uh, not, not the panelists, but the um, participants probably know much more about Toussaint Louverture who has risen to be the main spokesperson in everybody's mind for the revolution because he broke with that royalist model that uh, Jesus was just talking about. But um, he was not the original leader and Bukman Dudi was probably the person at Boakaman ceremony that pulled everybody together to plot this. And unfortunately he was uh, killed rather early in the fighting in 1791. And the leaders that rise to carry on the revolution are in fact, Georges Biasu, my person that I discovered in Florida, and Jean-Francois Papillon. And they are the two most prominent leaders, although there were many others who fought with them and under them, and then eventually sometimes broke with them. Um, but I just focused on some of the main leaders that I'm able to track 
through the archival record. And so Biasu uh, freely admitted that it was Toussaint who first proposed the idea of an uprising, but then Biasu wrote, uh, when it came to begin, he did not dare. And he actually hangs back until he sees which way the wind is blowing. He didn't have to step into the fray because he was already free, uh, but he was certainly allied to, to, uh, to Biasu from, uh, it, it appears, their youth. Uh, they knew each other's families. They talk and send letters back and forth, say hello to your mother for me and so on. So um, Biasu is the one who actually claims that he started it, even though Bukman we know really was the first. And uh, there was a great quote that I found in these Spanish records from Biasu. I am the chief of the counter revolution. I began the war almost without arms, without munitions, without supplies, and almost without resources on August 23rd, 1791, a time that will always be remembered among the most magnificent of the universe. Now, that's a, a glorious statement and a claim, and it's partially true, uh, but we should say that he was not literate. He had French secretaries who wrote for him, and eventually they are sent off to prison in Puerto Rico. So their influence has yet to be, uh, you know, analyzed or studied, I think, but it is, it is important. Um, so we get the revolution started in 1791, and, um, you know, you have to track how it goes from there, it's not an easy thing. And they're fighting with basically nothing. There's a correspondence uh, between Toussaint and Biasu and Toussaint saying, uh, you know, we're trying to get uh, big rocks piled up to, you know, pour down onto the people when they come after us. And he's saying, don't let anybody drink too much and that sort of thing. So it's a rugged start with not much as Biasu talked about, um, but where they will eventually get some support is from Spanish sources. And uh, John Garrigus and others have written about there really is no border between the Spanish two thirds of the island and the French one third of the island. And that that porous border is the way people get food, supplies, military uh, weaponry and that sort of thing. So um, these uh, leaders in the North were already very, very familiar with the Spanish system and had had a lot of contact with uh, Spanish officials on the border. And when they run out of money supplies and so on, despite their bravery, they need help and uh, they are going to take it from Spain. And as Jesus points out, Spain had for three centuries been already admitting uh, black military units or depending on black military units throughout their uh, holdings, including in the Philippines. So throughout the globe, Black military units were already received in the Spanish military, receiving medals, titles, and so on. This is a little bit of an escalation because their name comes to be the Black Auxiliaries of Carlos IV. So it's a slightly elevated uh, recognition of them as being directly linked to the King of Spain. Um, but for centuries, they had been receiving those uh, military corporate privileges, which includes not being tried in civil courts, which includes payment, which includes, you know, movement through the Atlantic world. And, and you can see why it would be an option preferable to others. And Jesus also mentioned the important role of the Catholic Church, uh, having received Blacks into the Catholic Church since medieval period, basically in Spain. And it's a, a, a standard pattern, again, with privileges, with protection, with direct corporate um, ideas about the king as the figurehead to whom you make petitions and receive remedy from. And so um, the ideas of kings as, as others have also already pointed out is something not unfamiliar either in African locales or in anywhere in the Spanish world. Um, so it's not surprising that when they run out of supplies they take the offer of the Spanish and in fact, they reject other offers from Great Britain and from um, France uh, in the Republic eventually. And allegedly in one of their correspondences, both Biasu and Jean-Francois signed, they said, since the beginning of the world, we have obeyed the will of a king. We have lost the king of France, but we are dear to him of Spain who constantly shows us reward and assistance. 
We therefore cannot recognize you, the French Republic, until you have enthroned a king. So again, uh, you know, as Jesus pointed out, some people sound uh, surprised that royalism is the choice, but it shouldn't be a surprise. It's their best option. And they were very familiar with it. And uh, throughout uh, centuries, they had already received assistance and privilege uh, by royal connections. So uh, what do they know about a piece of paper written about the rights of men and so on? Although Laurent had a wonderful thing and I borrowed it and everybody does about one rebel having uh, strips of the rights of man in a little nation sack around his neck when he gets caught. So it's not to say they don't, uh, that some people don't look at that option, but royalism was a perfectly a legitimate one and not surprising. Um, so anyway, uh, the incorporation in military and church is important because there's a very important mulatto priest that I uh, also work on or I'm starting to, who is the uh, sort of the, the intermediary for Jean-Francois and the, the Spanish officials. Spanish officials welcome them in the Spanish side and in the French side eventually, but they're suspicious all the time. Uh, and especially after one incident when Jean-Francois's troops uh, ride in on horseback, thousands of them supposedly, and sack the city of Bayaha, killing many French who had not been evacuated yet. And so this idea of them as bloody and people who massacre innocent women and children is something that allows the Spanish officials on the ground to start saying, I don't trust these guys, we've got to get them out of here. And uh, when a treaty of peace is signed, finally, uh, after the revolution, Spain's agreement is to evacuate the auxiliaries and uh, to disband the auxiliaries of Carlos IV. And so uh, although they've been loyal, they've fought, they've risked their lives, uh, this is gonna be an evacuation of the island in 1795, 96. Um, Biasu and his troops and families leave from the North Coast and go to Florida. They're given the option, do you wanna to go to the Isle of Pines off the, an island off the coast of Cuba, which is a prison uh, place to this day, or do you wanna to go to Florida? Oops, is that me? Uh, I, have I run off my time? I'll quickly say, maybe I was, Yes. <laughs> I'll just say, so one group to Florida that I tracked. The largest group is Jean-Francois group who goes, everybody goes to Havana first, they won't admit them there. And they end up over 700 of them in Cadiz, Spain, where I've also tracked some of their problems. Uh, another group goes as Miriam Martin, our grad student wrote about uh, Jean, Jean Francois, aid is Juan Santiago to Central America um, and René Soledre La France is following another group to Portobello, Panama. They always thought they would get back together again. They write letters about that and it isn't going to happen. But um, continuing to study their different routes, what happens to them on the ground where they go um, and the Spanish archives are amazing for it. Thank you. Sorry to run over. Thank you. Brandon? Yeah. Uh, so first, just like uh, everybody else, I want to uh, make sure to uh, say my great appreciation uh, for everybody who uh, makes Haiti Week happen, not only this year, but uh, but every year. It's a, just a really phenomenal event. Uh, and uh, so that this year I was I was tasked with, uh, you know, based on my research uh, uh, with uh, sort of thinking, we, we're talking about uh, the relevance of the Haitian Revolution, the relevance of Haitian history, the relevance of Haiti for uh, Black North Americans and African Americans. Uh, so I had that task and uh, uh, also, and as I was thinking about that task, uh, the, great, uh, the great scholar of Haitian history, really of uh, American as a hemisphere concept, right? American history, Marlene Doubt, uh, made a really innocuous, what I thought was a really sort of obvious, you know, not obvious, but a, a really uh, innocuous comment on Twitter that the Haitian Revolution is a cornerstone of African-American history. Uh, and it's a comment that got a lot of backlash. Uh, and uh, so when seeing that, and also with this task, uh, I wanted to put some thoughts to paper uh, really about what may seem self-evident to a lot of us here, but maybe it's not so self-evident. And that's just simply uh, why Haiti Week? 
why Haiti Week in Black History Month, right? What is this thing that we're doing? Uh, so some thoughts. Okay. Our ancestors did not care about the United States of America. Before setting foot on ships that millions would never leave from which many would leap, there were Igbo and Wolof, Yoruba and Congolese. They were thrust into the anomalous intimacy of the hold, branded as chattel, defined as Negro, shackled as strangers who shared their color and their condition on that torturous passage on the sea. They began a process of becoming. In a world far from home, in the face of a type of alienation incompatible with life for those who cherish belonging, Igbo and Wolof became African. This new people labored alongside each other, clearing forests where their blood and sweat would wet fields of cotton and cane. They sang together and played together. They rebelled together and escaped together. They laughed, wept, slept, and died together. They created together. In the plantations, mines, factories, and farms came new music, new food, new rituals, new beliefs. Out of a diaspora came an experience of feeling in a politics. Yes, a politics of blackness that existed independent of the state, that preceded the nation state, that transcended what will become the United States. Later ideas of domestic and foreign were not the conceptual categories of the great masses of black people in the early United States. Those were not part of their vernacular, of their understanding of the uprising that began in 1791. A black history that ends at US borders, a nation-based project of African-American history would not, did not make sense to the group of rebels who took to the streets, for instance, in Philadelphia in 1804. On the night of July 4th, the date when white Americans celebrated their national independence, a group of black men formed themselves into a company with elected officers. They marched military style down several city blocks, threatening violence on the white folks they encountered. The next night they gathered again, their numbers having swelled into the hundreds. Armed as before, they damned the whites saying they will show them St. Domingo. The Haitian Revolution was inspirational and aspirational. It was ample proof of the possibility of self-deliverance from enslavement and the vulnerability of enslavers. It was nourishing. It was known. The Haitian Revolution was on the minds of the thousands of Black men who took up arms to defeat the slaveholding Confederacy. The name of Toussaint Louverture, as one chaplain in the Union Army would know, was passed from mouth to mouth until it became a secret household word. Those soldiers struck a blow for the United States, that's true. They spoke of rights, they spoke of citizenship, yet they maintained a belief that the Haitian Revolution mattered, that Haiti mattered, that their racial identities and experience of enslavement and oppression, and yes, their political commitments complicated their place in the emergent world of nation states. For many, Haiti would become a particular point of pride, affinity, and affiliation. Across the 19th century, the Haitian state stretched forth its hand to black people in the United States. It said that Haiti was the country of all black people. Its constitution said the same thing. And black people reached back, they reached up from the depths of a nominal freedom. Black activists and abolitionists fought for the diplomatic recognition of Haiti. Black journalists brought news from Port-au-Prince to private and public venues from Virginia to Philadelphia. Thousands bid farewell to the country of their birth. With more resources, you better bet more would have done the same. Looking out from the mountains above Port-au-Prince, one immigrant captured the experiences of many and the aspirations of many more. I have adopted myself a Haitian, he wrote. Under the safeguard of her constitution is where I've chosen to live and die. The end of the Civil War created the conditions for the remaking of the US Constitution, for new claims to black civil and political rights, for an emphasis on the freedoms that black people should have been able to claim on the basis of their US citizenship. But where I ask has citizenship been an uncomplicated claim? Where in the post-slavery Americas? Where in the post-colonial world? Where within the world's imperial nation states? In this small part of the world where emancipation remains on the horizon and our ancestors went free, they stood a brief moment in the sun, then moved back towards slavery. Shout out to W.B. Du Bois. Back to a past that was present and future. Land and independence, land as independence was an ambition. It was a dream deferred in Haiti and Jamaica and Alabama and Mississippi. 
The mine and the plantation, the whip and the rifle were the brutal realities that spanned that black world as white states expanded as empires and made mockeries of black sovereignties and borders. What is national history of empires? What is national history in a world of empires and enslavement, of empire as enslavement? In a world where Jim Crow stamp, stomps on the throats of Filipinos and Cubans and Haitians, where racism, capitalism, and militarism know no borders. That's what Frederick Douglass knew what he meant in 1893 when he told 1,500 Black Chicagoans why there was so much coolness between the United States and Haiti. When he told them that Haiti is Black and we have not yet forgiven Haiti for being Black. This is what those Black Chicagoans understood. This is what they demonstrated when they erupted in applause. And that's why we're here today. The lesson of these solidarities, these imaginings forged across centuries, founded in the depths of the hold and reformulated against the varied weapons formed against them, formed against us, is this. That the struggle for democracy and dignity waged by striking workers in Haiti is the struggle for the basic right to a living wage and affordable housing for Black people in North Nashville that there is no better time than now than this Black History Month to strive for freedom globally to commemorate a Haiti week. Thank you. Thank you. All three presentations are right on point and, and better, no better time than now. Thank you so much. It is now open for questions or comments from the uh, audience. Um, who would like to begin? I ended my last class as I rushed to this one with my students talking about Haiti. Um, and uh, I wanna continue that because I, I, these presentations are, uh, every year that we've done this, we have had uh, incredible um, discussions around Haiti. And I uh, would like to hear what, you, what questions you have or comments for that matter. Well, let me start off with a question. Uh, the importance of Haiti as a, an African-American event is something that uh, Brandon, uh, in a sense, underscored. And I'd like for you to say more about that because I, I've always treated it as an African-American event uh, in an international sense because of the support for Haiti in the United States. Uh, could you say more about that? Uh, not only Frederick Douglass, but the I was telling students today how African-Americans and black people throughout the Caribbean, we were talking about the Caribbean, look to Haiti as a symbol of their own freedom. And I, I think it's really important uh, the way that uh, we started the panel uh, with, with Jesus really situating us uh, in the present, um, mm -hmm. really underscoring that this is a living history. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, in, in many ways it's, uh, it's a bit mis, uh, misleading, uh, even our, 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 our reference points can be a little misleading, uh, you know, with the Douglases, mm -hmm. with uh, the solidarities forged in after the first U.S. occupation of Haiti in 1915, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that can be misleading in the sense that, uh, you know, really uh, situates it uh, as solidarities, as a... Uh, uh, as a revolution and as a black nation state that are really uh, about uh, past struggles, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when really, I think, uh, you know, as, as you're pointing us to Tiffany, uh, you know, it, it is far more productive to think about it as a, a uh, in some sense to think about this as a living political project, right? That's very much one in which our past is enveloped in, in which our present is enveloped in the past, mm -hmm. right? in which we are still completely striving for, uh, you know, a, a, a liberation, which, you know, and unfortunately is still a sort of future liberation. Mm -hmm. uh, so with that, that, that's a long winded way of, of saying, uh, I'm actually interested, so you asked a question to me, uh, I, I would actually sort of respond with a question back too. So like, how has Haiti and, uh, not just a Haiti rooted in the Haitian revolution, but how has Haiti been in point? inform your political consciousness? Because I know it has. Yeah. Uh, right, yeah, so that's, I, honestly, I would throw it back. 
yeah, I, I, when I came here, I, one of the first things I wanted to do was a course on Haiti, because it seems to me that that is a pivotal point of black internationalism, that uh, there is a long history, which I've been looking at in, in terms of uh, being inspired by uh, the effort at Haiti to gain its freedom. And at a moment, uh, and I want like, like Jesus and, and Jane to come into this conversation because I was, uh, I was kicked off my class uh, and that's why I was winded a few minutes ago with this crazy uh, bright space and all that nonsense. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I, when I got back in, my students were already talking about Haiti and they were all, and I didn't give this to them. They, they found it themselves. They were talking about Du Bois's ancestry and the mm -hmm. connections that people have to Haiti. I think that that is one of those pivotal moments that we have to have if we're talking about what you work on with black internationalism, what, what I know Jane works on, and I'm, I've met Jesus, that is not a past moment. And that's why this fool that we have in the White House uh, keep coming at black countries as s-hole countries. And I have picked that up in my classes this semester to make a point about the importance and uh, of, of um, of Haitian history and I like, uh, Jane, I want you to come in here because I, I found what you had to say absolutely interesting, uh, fascinating in terms of, uh, where's it, Jesus, uh, forgive me if I'm tired, uh, 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 in terms, no, it was Jesus, of, 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 of Haitians uh, naturally going for royalty uh, instead of democracy, because that does come from Africa. It's one of the many links, it seems to me. Could I get you two in the conversation? Well, I, I, as Jesus and I both agree on that for sure, that th this has both an African and a medieval European uh, concept. Mm -hmm. But um, in terms of what Brandon was just saying, and you too, about the memory of this and how present it is, I work a lot with public, this is a little off the base, but uh, I work a lot with public groups about marking and memorializing sites and people that have been neglected in the main narratives. And, you know, the a group from Haiti that went up and helped our American Revolution in Savannah now have a statue uh, to them. Um, I was doing a talk in Florida and the Haitian American community came up and it happened to be that we didn't know that was the day that the, the earthquake happened. And when they went home the next day, we knew everything had been destroyed, but their goal was to and they got an agreement from the uh, city government to mount a statue to be a Sioux in St. Augustine. So, and then, uh, you know, there's the Tucson Loverture Cemetery right down in Franklin from 1811. So how even places like Franklin in the middle of the boondocks in Tennessee is marking, you know, Tucson Loverture or other places are marking, you know, be a Sioux or the Chasseurs in Savannah. I think there's a rising interest in, in making this a visible part of the history, as well as getting it into curricula and that sort of thing. So that's a little side light, but I hope it linked to what Brandon was saying in you too. Mm -hmm. Hey, Suze. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, th this is one of the, this is one of the major, um, I think, aspects of, of my work that I'm still trying to kind of flesh out better is that West and Central African influence. And, and historians, specifically cultural historians, have pointed out a lot of those links already. The Kingdom of the Congo, for instance, is, is, is prevalent, right, in, in, in the Haitian case, um, in the revolution and these ideas. But to me, what's really important about making these links, right, this, 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 this pivotal point, as you mentioned, in, in Black internationalism mm -hmm. is, is to look at the ways in which um, not only Haiti serves as, a, as an inspiration for liberation um, in the U.S., and particularly, I mean, recent work has, you know, I'm thinking of Cristina Soriano, her recent book, Tides of Revolution, you know, making those connections in the Americas, I think, is, 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 is pivotal, but, but understanding the complexities of those political projects yeah, yeah right and not just saying well you know they broke with the monarchy and they create alexander petion and it was the republic well no the, he also had authoritarian tendencies mm -hmm. right and so it makes people very uncomfortable 
because immediately the link is to say, well, it, it was a failed state. Uh, it's Haiti is this tired as, as Professor Dow points out, right? And Brandon uh, mentioned her. I mean, she, her work is, has also been inspirational. This tired trope of it's the poorest country in the Western hemisphere. It's a failed state, right? Well, it's a, it's, it's a failure if you look at it as never returning to hyper productivity in the plantation world. Right, that's that's how we view it through this capitalist lens. Whereas how we should per perhaps understand it is that they wage their own political struggles in very sometimes paradoxical, seemingly paradoxical ways, but very complex ways, right? And so they utilize systems that were already in place to try and push for their liberation and to use uh, and and uh, to push for their freedom, right? And so that to me, it's always interesting what what can we learn about those lessons. For political lessons, you know, I, I think in some ways we've shied away from political history in our profession to a degree. And, and I mean, I, to me, one of the things that, that I always think about, right, and in, in looking at the current events in Haiti is the relative silencing that we still see. I, I don't, I mean, apart from some local independent media sources and to, to Jane's point, maybe like the Miami Herald, you know, they might have a few pieces here and there, but I'm not hearing much about the ongoing demo pro-democracy struggles in Haiti, which is a massive, massive movement, right? Whether it's workers, students, journalists, wh whatever the case may be. And so to me, in some ways, yes, the scholarship on Haiti and the, and the revolution has exploded in the academy for the last two, you know, two decades, three decades, whatever the case may be. But when we talk about the current situation, to me, at least, it seems like there has been a relative, almost another silencing, right, to, to, to invoke Trujillo there. Uh, and so the, to me, that's very telling, and it speaks to one of Brandon's points, which is, you know, they, the, the rest of the world couldn't, uh, un, they, they, they couldn't accept a black state, whether that was a black republic or a black, or a black monarchy with, you know, with, with Christophe, it, it, the fact is that it's black. And so you're destroying in many ways, uh, not just, uh, you know, you're not just literally destroying the plantation complex, but in, in very metaphorical ways, this sort of this European ideal, right? That is, as, as we know, uh, is rooted in, in, in whiteness. So, yeah. Yeah, if I, if I could jump in real quick, real quick, I mean, this is, uh, you're raising such critical points about, you know, sort of uh, the, the importance the importance of thinking about black politics and especially especially those black politics that are rendered most illegible and that are most silenced right and uh, your point that all the reason why they're illegible is often because uh it's because they challenge or they they go against you know the these indices these these metrics uh for what we consider what is considered successful, or even what is considered political, what is considered, what fits into sort of hegemonic frameworks, right? And I, I think that's exactly it, like exactly what you're saying. Like if you have in the, the, po the late 19th century world, right? They're always measuring Haitian success mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what, what we would consider now like GDP. Like what were, what were the, what was the productivity? What were sugar exports in, 1790 versus what are they in 1890? Well, they've gone down and that means that Haiti has fallen, right? When really that's, that's, that, it, that should be read as an index of the success of the black politics that led to the revolution and that persisted in, you know, what Casimir calls the sovereign people, right? Right, that those, that, that's basically telling you those stats, they, they tell you that people refused to go to the plantations. Right, they refused European powers who would have made them. They refused the Haitian state boyer who tried to make them return. Right, and they didn't become plantation workers again. Right, but again, but it's you know, it's how do we read those policies, and we have to read them, and then what lessons can we draw from those? Right, uh, and it's 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 something that we accept right in this room, but it, it's it's difficult to sort of articulate and convey that sometimes. Can I just pop in too to say, you know, the plantation system, the destruction of the environment and the ecology through that massive, de uh, you know, dedication to sugar is one of the reasons when you look at the island today, it's devastated and, you know, there is, there's no forestry left. That means floods, that means terrible, you know, economic 
problems for that third of the island. On the other two thirds, not to say that it's some miraculous place, but it's got forests, it's got, you know, small land holdings, and it's not, you know, viewed as a failure that way. And there's a real ecological, you know, connection to the inequality of the, you know, of life in the third on the, on the French side, where it was ruined by sugar. Mm -hmm. uh I, I I'll, absolutely I, I agree with Jane in, in, in that sense. I want to go back, if I may, uh, to one of the points that Brandon made. Um, these this, these metrics that 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 we use, right, or that that the Western hegemonic powers were utilizing to 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 decide whether or not. I think it points to to the arrogance, right, of these of these uh, European empires to say. You know, I mean, now we're seeing literally in France a memorialization of Napoleon. Mm -hmm. I mean, Marlon Nadal is, is posting about this constantly and I learned so much from her. She said, she said you know, this guy is a genocidal uh, expansionist emperor, right? And yet he's celebrated. Oh, well, he was a man of his time, right? Thomas Jefferson, well, he was a man of his time. Okay. Well, yeah, so was Toussaint Louverture, so was Je Georges Biassou, mm -hmm. so was uh, Jean-Francois uh, Jean -Francois Dessalines and Christophe, but they liberated the, the, the Haitian people, right? I mean, and, and again, we can get into the complexities of the system with which they rule and how perhaps, you know, Christophe is utilizing sort of labor of, of the formerly enslaved to build this in incredible fortress, right? Yeah, we can get into those debates, but the, the fact of the matter is that there was an emancipation 50, 60, 80 years before the rest of, you know, that we're talking the US and Spain and, and France in Brazil, right, emancipate their, their colonies. And so to me, this is, it's, it's, it points towards this, er this, this colonial arrogance, right, to, to say that, you know, well, of course, Haiti is a rulers in the, in the immediate post-independence period, there are these authoritarian kings and emperors, and look where it leads the, the, um, to these 20th century uh, uh, dictatorships. Right, pa Papa Duva, uh, Papa Doc, and Baby Doc Duvalier. There's a straight line, and then even I mean, even James himself, right, draws similar connections to Castro mm -hmm. in Cuba. And I, I, I think it's more complex than simply saying, well, they laid the foundations for despotism, as one scholar uh, noted, right. And so it's we have to really think about it in the in the in in the in the context of how they were engaging these political discourses, and and of course how they're doing it now. Are there other questions from the audience? We've got a couple in the chat box, uh, okay. Tiffany. Uh, a couple of comments, really good comments uh, that lead to a question about larger uh, international black unity uh, mm -hmm. and what do these historical moments mean for that today? Uh, and also what the 2010 earthquake uh, in, in Haiti um, mm -hmm. uh, meant. And if, as long as I'm uh, speaking, I would just like to make one brief comment. It occurs to me, one of the beautiful things all of you have done in this panel is make complicated these histories that we often read as very simple. Uh, but it also occurs to me that sometimes there's a tension between the political project, which needs simple history, right? Which needs that one simple answer. And it's hard to get people to rally at the barricades around a nuanced argument. Uh, just, just a comment. I wanna go back to something that uh, Brandon uh, threw at me, which I think you are addressing. And I just wanna make that explicit. For me, in terms of my interest in the, the diasporic world, black world, uh, Haiti's at the center of that. Uh, the, the revolution, that's not just the revolution, it is the struggle since the revolution and their efforts to continue to fight for their own freedom. Um, and to the extent that uh, Jesus, I think it was you that was saying uh, that gets covered up, you know, in the ways that we, what we pick to choose, what people focus on in terms of Haiti, that says to me that there is a flaw in the academic project. Uh, in terms of how, what questions we raise about Haiti. Uh, the, there is, uh, except for Jane and uh, one or two others, there is no central place for Haiti in our curriculum, except for the course that I teach and then what Brandon teaches. But I'm, when I say central, 
in the curriculum, I've sat on the curriculum committee and the AXO committee, which is our general education. And I bring this up all the time to our students. They graduate from college without a sense of the importance of Haiti. How do we conquer that? This is a little off the topic, but Paula Covington and I taught years ago a research project, you know, in the library where we looked at the video or the, the popular uh, television coverage of Haiti to the news coverage of Haiti. And every image was, you know, somebody standing in front of a disaster, burning tires or wrecked buildings. And, and the media also projects that even more powerfully than our academic works do. So that's something that also needs to be. And now we're looking at the scenes of everybody, you know, going through clouds of tear gas and again, being shot in groups. And mm -hmm. that media coverage is, is, I think, much more damaging than what we're writing about or the neglect even. Mm -hmm. Somehow that's got to be addressed. Oh, I, can I follow up on, on Jane's comment okay. there? Mm -hmm. um, so that reminds me again uh, to, to, to sort of quote uh, Professor Doubt uh, here. She, she had a piece recently on the, the sort of the, the representation, the image uh, that, we, that we often see, right? So the contemporary image would be a, a, a Haitian protester burning the tire or slinging stones towards the state police, right? And, and historically the images that we saw, right, in this, and one of the comments here that I see is this idea of black dystopia, right? And so uh, the, the idea of these savage uh, uh, Haitian uh, insurgents, you know, cutting off the head of, of these uh, innocent French, uh, white French colonists. And to me, that's that I, I see those scenes in the United States now. I mean, in the way that the media is representing, right, like Black Lives Matter, what do we see? Well, we see uh, the images of, of the police uh, precinct burning down and we see, right, so there's, there's this sense to me, at least that, that, that sort of this representation through the image is always it, it, in some ways focused or, or, or zooms in on the violence that black people engage in uh, in their desperation for actual liberation, for actual freedom, rather than the violence that is uh, done onto them by the state or, 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 or its forces. And so I think that's really important to, to sort of make that, that connection because I, I, I do think it, it does a lot of damage, right? And, and, and when people say, well, you know, they're destroying property. They burnt down the CVS. You know, that is how, how dare they, you know, that, and well, it's, it's, if you think about the Haitian case and, and not to get too metaphorical here, but it was clear, you have to burn the plantation to the ground so that you can engage in, in, in your struggle. And, and so again, I'm not, I don't mean to suggest that we should go and burn all these, 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 these sort of uh, 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 spaces of, of capitalist production but but that to me it makes when I see that I I draw that link again back back to back to Haiti right because it was very clear questions I, okay. yes yeah, so I did just in the chat I, I saw uh, two uh, two people uh, really uh, Certainly, this this discussion is this question of unity of common cause that I think has a lot to do with this discussion about uh, uh, media representation. I don't. I, I think these are uh, these are parallel or even overlapping conversations. Uh, so you know, basically, it, let me try to think about how how I'm putting this. Uh, uh, so a historical example, right? Uh, so in uh, 1909-1910. Uh, John Hurst, who's a, uh, he is a Haitian citizen who is the son of African-American immigrants uh, to Haiti. Uh, he is uh, given a speech at a uh, major church in Washington, DC. And he tells the audience, uh, which of course is primarily African-American, he says, when I'm in Haiti, uh, my friends there, uh, they all question, they all ask, what's going on with black folks in the US? Have they surrendered their rights since Reconstruction? They say, are they a passive people? Uh, and then he says to them, he, to his crowd of African-Americans, he says, I tell them no. Uh, I tell them what they are getting basically is propaganda the same way you get propaganda. 
Actually, when I'm in the US, African Americans respond in kind. They say, what's going on in Haiti? Are these a warlike people? Basically what he's saying, and then he goes on to say, what we need is more translation. What we need is a circulation, quite literally, of more independent black newspapers between Port-au-Prince and Washington, DC. We need a way to know ourselves across national borders, right? Uh, so again, to this conversation, this is why I say I don't think this conversation about unity, thinking about common causes, divorce from this other conversation about representation, right? Uh, as an aspiration, mm -hmm. there's a lot of power uh, to this idea of Black internationalism. There's a lot of power in this as a political project, but it is, of course, it's a project, right? Uh, and as with any political project, uh, there's real work that has to be done. Uh, I agree wholeheartedly that a lot of times we see tension uh, amongst, you know, quote unquote, or within, uh, uh, quote unquote, uh, you know, different ethnic black communities. Uh, I think that's true. And I don't think that, but that is not the natural state of things, right? These are, that tension is a product of, uh, of capitalism, of a, uh, an idea that there's a scarcity of resources, that there has to be a competition for resources. Uh, that some of this is the product of, uh, of even seeing ourselves as very distinct ethnic people, right? As not having political similarities, political solidarities, or even cultural similarities, right? Uh, so there's a lot working against this, but the, the aspiration itself is worth fighting for. Uh, is the point that I think Hearst was saying. And I think he was also saying that there are ways of going uh, about transcending uh, those tensions, that there are ways of going about emphasizing the things that connect us across difference, right? That there are ways of going about, uh, you know, trying to achieve the things uh, that will achieve freedom, not just for one segment of black folks, but for all. Other comments or questions, we could go on and on uh, with this discussion. And I like to, I've got two minutes uh, before it's uh, 1230. Is, uh, uh, to our presenters, are there other points you'd like to raise? Jesus? Yeah, Tiffany, I just wanted to, I realized that I didn't touch on the question of the, the post-earthquake uh, and, and the role that the 2010 plays here. I, mm -hmm. I think with, with what, what we see is, is that um, it opens the door for international aid, of course, uh, which is good. But at the same time, we, we can understand that uh, this sort of international aid often comes with strings attached. Right. And, and I think one of the things that that points to is that there's this that, that feeds into this sort of predatory and corrupt leadership that we see from within, but but also influenced by external uh, uh, powers and, 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 and interests. And so I think 2010 in many ways devastating as it was in, in a very real way for, for uh, you know, for so many hundreds of thousands of people in Haiti, and then the diaspora that it also creates, I think in some ways also points towards these external factors that, that always feel like they have uh, some sort of stake in, 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 in having their hands in, in, into the, in the Haitian state. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I, mm -hmm. I think that it has a lot to do in it and it lays the sort of the groundwork for some of these other processes to happen the, that, we, that we're seeing now, right? Petro Caribe and the funds and everything that's going on with Venezuela. And, and so it, it's, it's interrelated and I think it, it creates a lot of that instability uh, that, that, you know, corrupt leadership then takes advantage of and, you know, creates the, mm -hmm. the, the situation today. We could go on and on about um, Haiti and the importance of it. And I'll go back to the question that as I end threw at me, uh, because I'm very interested in uh, these shows, not just in Haiti, but in Africa as well, and the places of black population. So I'll leave you with the image that sticks in my mind. I left my studio and I had to leave. I was in Haiti was three years ago at a Haitian studies meeting. And um, I went into the city uh, one morning, uh, Hector and I, um, and I, then it haunts me to this day because where the, where the earthquake was most devastating had not been touched. 
uh, it was a mass, as far as I could see, of rubble. And Haitian women who have long been uh, market women had come out to sell the food and whatever they could under the incredible um, economic conditions. And in the middle of that, I saw this uh, Haitian father walking uh, clearly toward school with his two girls. And the two images together were jarring. The one of the impact of the, of the, of the, of the earthquake leaving people to live among the rubble. No matter how much money the US and everybody else said they got, the people didn't get it. Okay. Uh, surviving once again, as, as Haitians have done for so long. And then this clearly upperly mobile father with two little, pretty little girls with bows in their hair, walking in the rubble to get to school. Because uh, for me, I think about that image all the time. It was jarring for me because initially the rubble was jarring, that it was still there. Of course, the, the conference was at a nice hotel, but not that wasn't what was happening with ordinary people. And I think it reminded me of the constant struggle to your point, uh, Brandon, that I think about all the time in the work I'm trying to do. And, and even as a historian, uh, the constant struggle of black people for freedom of black people for the right to determine their, their uh, destiny. Uh, for, for Haitians is, is the prime example of that, of constantly uh, struggling for that. So I leave that uh, as part of our role as thinkers and scholars. And I, I know Marlene Doubt's work as well, which I think is absolutely wonderful, that we keep doing that work and we keep having this every year. And I wanna thank the Center for Latin American Studies for backing this each year and um, our scholars who are here, who are working in this area. And thank you uh, for always having me here. It's one of uh, uh, the best points of the year for me.